atheists, rationalists, skeptical free thinkers, people who are historically oppressed in their own times, people who would be vanguards to men, to step forward and lead them out of the dark age and into a more privileged time. Until 30 years ago, they had hit, even today making up but 2% of the population, they began to organize and move forward. With their approach comes the end of the time of God at the beginning of the time of man. With no further ado, let me give to you one of these radicals. I present to you the living dance. This is a response to Creation Museum's video, Ken Ham responds to Bill Nye the Humanist Guy. This in itself was a response to Bill Nye's Big Think video regarding the dangers of filling children's heads with nonsense that's too childish even for them. But before we begin, I'd like to point out that the organization that the individual I'm addressing leads has, in the past, been known to be somewhat less than ethical when it comes to suppressing the speech of those that dare to criticize the putrid vomit that they themselves choose to hurl across the arena of public discourse. As a result, I'd be grateful if you'd consider downloading this video as a contingency measure in case Mr. Ham needs to be introduced to the effect that Miss Streisand probably wishes she'd never experienced. In fact, if you're feeling particularly proactive, then please feel free to mirror it at your leisure. Now, with that said, there's a lot to get through, so let's dispense with the preliminaries and get down to business. Hi, this is Ken Ham, President and CEO of Answers in Genesis and the Creation Museum. Hello, Ken. My name's the Living Dinosaur. We haven't been introduced, but I'm one of those people who thinks it worthwhile to expend time and effort in stuffing creationists' ideas up their asses with as much gusto as physically possible. As luck would have it, of course, you happen to be a creationist, and a rather prominent one at that, so it looks like this fortuitous encounter will be a match made in heaven. Recently, a YouTube video featuring a person called Bill Nye the Science Guy received millions of views. Now, the video was called Creationism is Inappropriate for Children. Well, I really believe we should call Bill Nye the Science Guy, Bill Nye the Humanist Guy. Well, considering the mind-bogglingly ludicrous things you've dedicated your life to believing, Ken, I hate to inform you that the hallucinations you happen to be entertaining with regard to what moniker to bestow upon Mr. Nye are of little interest to those of us whose mental faculties are shall we say, present. You see, Bill Nye received the Humanist of the Year Award in 2010. So even though Bill Nye had some wonderful programs on PBS TV teaching exciting things about science, you know, when he was experimenting and putting things together and so on, and, you know, he did some real observational science there, Bill Nye also has an agenda to teach children not to believe in God to teach them their result of evolutionary processes, that they came from slime over millions of years. That's pretty slimy, Ken, even by creationist standards. But you are one of the top dogs, so I suppose you know all the shitty old tricks, eh? Putting aside your transparent rhetorical bullshit, it seems that you're either attributing to humanism a position it doesn't hold and then projecting that grotesque straw man onto Bill Nye, or deliberately misinterpreting what he said and dishonestly twisting it to fit your agenda. In reality, while secular humanism eschews the supernatural, as far as I'm aware, it has not and does not mandate that its adherents preach to anyone, much less than children, not to believe in God. You may not have noticed, Ken, but the insane fuckers on soapboxes in towns everywhere are almost exclusively of a religious persuasion. 
bent on spreading their particular flavor of fundamentalist disease and seldom rational atheists trying to cure it. Furthermore, to my knowledge, Bill Nye doesn't actively encourage theistic disbelief in minors either, and in the case of his Big Think video, he most certainly didn't. What he did do, though, is indirectly bring into question the existence of your God. More specifically, the one that created the world in seven days, 6,000 years ago, that murdered most of humanity in a global flood and that created the languages of the earth in an instant. And while he didn't say it explicitly, the implication was obviously quite clear to you that reality has all but conclusively demonstrated that your God doesn't exist. But that's hardly the same thing as asserting that no gods exist, is it, Ken? Because if you're clever enough to ascribe to your god properties that cannot be tested, then it cannot by definition ever be empirically disproved. If on the other hand you're stupid enough to insist that your god has properties that sound like they were dreamt up thousands of years ago by, oh, I don't know, let's say ignorant primitive camel humpers, then that god can easily be dismissed as soon as it's determined that said properties are incongruent with physical reality. You know, Ken like your God. As it happens though, the majority of Christians and other theists aren't as dumb as you and your followers and don't believe in your God either. So when you say Mr. Nye is trying to teach children not to believe in God, what you really mean is that his promotion of reason and established science runs contrary to your Bronze Age beliefs, and while I can understand that you find it discomforting, all I can say in lieu of solace is, tough shit. Plenty of Christians have come to grips with the reality of these discoveries and incorporated them into their beliefs, and I'd strongly suggest that you take the time to find out how to do the same rather than wasting it defending the indefensible. Because not doing the former leaves you looking like a backward, doltish buffoon, and doing the latter is compounding the problem by turning you into a lying one. Now with that said, I'm going to do something that may seem a little strange to you, and that's keep an open mind. You see, I'm willing to acknowledge that I may have missed something, so if you can provide some actual verifiable evidence that Bill Nye has an agenda to actively dissuade people from their spiritual beliefs, I'd be happy to consider it. But if all you have is your word, which perhaps unsurprisingly means absolutely jack shit to me, then as far as I'm concerned, you can take your filthy little lie and stick it up your wrinkled, saggy Antipodean ass. In fact, Bill Nye really doesn't understand science. I mean, the word science means knowledge. And you can divide science into historical science, that's talking about the past, or observational science, that's the science that builds our technology. Yes. Well, it does appear you went a little OCD on this historical observational science bullshit, Ken, because you mentioned it a number of times in your video. I'm not sure whether that's the early onset Alzheimer's kicking in, or that you've convinced yourself it's some form of argument, but in either case I'm going to postpone its rectal reinsertion for the time being. That's because I've got a lot of ground to cover as it is, and so time is at a premium, and also because a pair of cranially confused monkeys from your R&D department also brought it up in the companion video to this one, and so have afforded me the opportunity to address it at a later date but do rest assured that I fully intend to do so and will be mopping up the feces they've been smearing over their enclosure as soon as I'm done dealing with you. He says if you deny evolution to children, they're going to have problems because we need engineers. Well, wait a minute. Engineering and evolution? What has evolution got to do with engineering? I mean, Bill Nye himself actually is not a scientist. He studied mechanical engineering. It's both interesting and bemusing that you criticize him for not being a scientist, Ken, when it appears that you're not one either. I do realize that you hold a bachelor's in applied science, but if you think that qualifies you for anything other than being a bench technician, then allow me to disenfranchise you of your misconception. I know this because I've run numerous laboratories over the years and know from experience that there's a special word that people like you reserve for scientists, and that's sir. So while neither of you are qualified scientists, it's interesting to compare what you've done with your educations. You see, Mr. Nye has put his to good use and worked as a successful engineer, becoming a productive member of society. You, on the other hand, turned your hand to religion and worked diligently on separating the gullible from their cash, 
becoming a parasite clinging to society's member. Mr. Nye used his solid foundational knowledge and coupled it to his talent as an entertainer to educate the public about the quite spectacular vistas that science has spread before us. While you took that knowledge and coupled it to a talent for enticing credulous simpletons to open their wallets to gleefully defecate on the achievements and memories of people whose boots you're unfit to lick. Spot the difference, Ken. You see, it takes one kind of person to use a basic knowledge of a subject to inspire others, and it takes quite another to take the same rudimentary knowledge, callously discard it and have the astounding arrogance to proclaim that he knows better than countless thousands of brilliant researchers who've dedicated lifetimes to studying the same subjects. Humility is just a collection of letters to people like you, isn't it, Ken? And as for what evolution has to do with engineering, well, we'll get onto that after we listen to what you squeezed out next. And he worked for Boeing at one stage. I hope he did not apply his evolutionary principles uh, to any of Boeing's airplanes, because if he did, I wouldn't want to be flying in them. I don't want to fly in something that was built by chance random processes. What do you think, all the parts just lay them out there on the runway and they come together or something? No, of course he didn't apply his evolutionary ideas to his engineering at Boeing, otherwise we'd be in real trouble. I'm not going to spend much time going over your grotesque straw man there, Ken, because I know you're more than aware of why your analogy is as flawed as a virgin after a gangbang. I'm sure you're aware that no one apart from a lying creationist turd would insist that evolution is a random process because I'm sure that someone has at some point explained natural selection to you. And I'm also sure that you're aware that airliner parts don't reproduce with variation and so cannot evolve and that no one has ever suggested that evolution occurs via the instantaneous assembly of disparate parts. Yet despite all this, you continue to make and attack this shoddy and deliberately inaccurate parody of evolution, presumably as a surrogate for all the legitimate arguments you simply don't have. As for evolutionary ideas in engineering, Ken, well... Here's a prime example of how being in possession of an ego that can be measured in light years and a modesty that can be measured in plank lengths seldom results in someone looking like an iconic visionary but instead like a supercilious bumbling fool. That's because it took less than a minute for me to find these papers on evolutionary algorithms in aeronautical engineering, algorithms that owe their existence solely to and are a validation of the theory of biological evolution. This leaves me pondering exactly how much time you put into thinking about the shite you spout, Ken, and whether you even bothered to consult those R&D monkeys of yours on the subject, assuming that they weren't too busy sniffing each other's asses to answer. Bill Nye is really implying that if we're going to teach children creation, that it's really a form of abuse, that creationism is inappropriate for children. Well, that's entirely a matter of perspective, isn't it, Ken? Because I don't think that Mr. Nye was saying that children shouldn't be taught about your fables as part of their upbringing or in a religious studies curriculum, but rather that your myths have no place in science class nor as an alternative to mainstream and essentially universally accepted scientific thought. Now, I'll mention that you're the one who brought up the emotive word abuse, not him, but since you used it, I will too. I personally fully endorse the concept that teaching children primitive and demonstrably false myths as if they were fact, and then encouraging, even ordering them to discard the knowledge that has raised us from the filth of our ignorance to the acme of our civilization is abuse. Unfortunately, such mental abuse isn't illegal, so as much as it disgusts me, I'm afraid that you and your kind are free to inflict it upon your own offspring. But I would be eternally grateful if you and your fellow demented dumb fucks would stop insisting on pushing it onto mine. I tell you what is real abuse, and I tell you what is inappropriate for children. When you take generations of kids and you teach them, they're just animals. There's no God. You're a result of millions of years of evolutionary processes. You just came from some slime over millions of years. Who determines right and wrong? You do. Who determines what's good and bad? You do. What is marriage? Whatever you want to make it to be. Unfortunately, Ken, the concept that your Bible contains some kind of transcendent and unalterable morality for the ages is somewhat fucked up the arse by the words it contains. 
And while I'm aware of the countless lame and frankly laughable ad hoc rationalizations as to why it's no longer acceptable to own and beat other human beings while at the same time being able to pig out a red lobster, the very fact that they need to be made means that in your worldview I would be forced to delegate my moral choices to people who claim to have a direct line to the big guy upstairs. Thus in lieu of not hearing voices inside my own head and of not being able to distinguish between someone who's actually hobnobbing with his ephemeralness and one who's merely trying to pick my pocket, the only rational route as far as I can see is to do what I've always done and that's use my own conscience. As for the psychological consequences of teaching evolution, I'm afraid that your perceived affront to our human dignity has no bearing as to the nature of reality. Because, Ken, as much as you might hate to admit it, we eat like animals, breathe like animals, defecate like animals, and fornicate like animals, and that alone should make it fairly easy for all but the most profound mental defectives to realize that we are animals. In addition, millions upon millions of pieces of evidence scream with deafening clarity to all but the most dim-witted of dumbfucks that, like other animals, we evolved from a common ancestor. I understand that you find this idea distasteful, Ken, but that's no excuse for denying it. I, for example, find it gut-churningly vile to contemplate that you and I are members of the same species, but am forced to accept the possibility as being the most likely explanation for the evidence before me. The grown-up thing to do in such a situation is to swallow your pride, accept what's patently true and find some way to deal with it like billions of others have before. You know, it's really people like Bill Nye that are damaging kids. Creationists are teaching children that they're special, that they're made in the image of God. And of course giving them a basis for developing technology that we can trust the laws of logic, we can trust the laws of nature, we can trust uh, the uniformity of nature. Teaching people to think wishfully and ignore evidence is anything but harmless as evidenced, for example, by the stunning success of abstinence-only programs. Furthermore, are you serious? Are people special just because they're made in the image of God? Is that true for Jeffrey Dahmer, Ken? Or Ted Bundy? Or John Wayne Gacy? And what about conjoined twins, Ken? Or Down syndrome victims? Or Ameliacs? Are they somehow less than special? And what about anuses, Ken? Does your god have one? And if so, why? Or nipples? Or genitals? You see what happens when you make laughably juvenile statements based on even more infantile beliefs, Ken? They're easier to pick apart than the remains of Ian Juby's Christmas turkey. As for your nod in the direction of presuppositional apologetics and the transcendental argument, well, I'm not going to go there because my goal is to rectally wrap anti-science claims and not argue against the existence of gods. Many excellent YouTubers far better equipped than I have handled these and other philosophical topics and if anyone would like to learn more, they could do a lot worse than watching and subscribing to the user Know No More. With that said, I should point out that regardless of the validity of these arguments and whether such a being or beings exist, the unassailable bastion of evidence for evolution in an ancient universe overwhelmingly indicates that yours does not. Finally, I find your affirmation of the uniformity of nature quite a pleasant surprise because it provides me with an exquisite opportunity to use it to beat the living shit out of you. But first, let's take a break for a little light entertainment and listen to the hilarious thing you said next. You know, Bill Knife really doesn't understand science. He's called Bill Nye the science guy. He doesn't understand science. <laughs> Sorry, Ken. I realize that was a bit of a cheap shot, but I maintain it was fully warranted because what I just witnessed was tantamount to a light gray kettle being badmouthed by an ebony pot that's just drifted past the event horizon of a black fucking hole. He doesn't understand the difference between observational science and historical science. I mean, he talks about the fact that, oh, we've got these ancient bones, we've got radioactivity. Wait a minute, of course we can observe radioactivity and we can experiment with it. But when it comes to bones, like dinosaur bones, you don't dig them up with labels telling you how old they are or dig them up with photographs telling you when they lived. 
Once again, I'll take a rain check on your little historical science fantasy and stuff it up the asses of one or perhaps both of your pet primates in a later video. Instead, let's get back to the point you made about the uniformity of nature and how I'm going to use it to be not particularly pleasant to you. You see, Ken, not only can we see and experiment with radioactivity, because of the uniformity of nature that you admitted to, we can be certain to a high degree of confidence that radionuclides behaved in the same way in the past as they do now. And in case you try and wheedle out of it by claiming you meant the past few millennia, centuries, decades or whatever other timescale best suits your goalpost shifting, I'll point out that unlike your kind of assertions, this tenet of modern science hasn't been conveniently pulled out of someone's back passage but is supported by empirical evidence. If you wish to retract your earlier statement and posit that the behavior of physical laws has changed over time, then kindly supply evidence of when and to what degree this occurred and a theoretical framework to explain how without invoking preternatural and unverifiable juju. Or just fuck right off. So with this established, Ken, it's an almost trivially simple task to accurately date fossils by measuring the appropriate isotope ratios in surrounding igneous layers and in some cases in igneous grains in the sedimentary strata themselves. Of course, this isn't quite the same as requiring the presence of a handwritten label or photograph, but quite frankly, only someone who spent his adult life walking around with what appears to be a pussy clinging tenaciously to his chin while presumably thinking it looked cool would be stupid enough to demand one. Instead, for people with even the tiniest soupçon of common sense, not to mention fashion sense, the current ocean of cross-confirmatory data using multiple isotope signatures is more than enough to reasonably conclude that these dates are reliable. He doesn't teach children how to think critically. He doesn't teach them how to think about science. He wants to teach them what to think, and he confuses historical science, beliefs about the past, and observational science that develops your technology. He puts those together and doesn't distinguish between the two. Again, you'll have to wait for me to rape your assertion on historical science at a later date, but right now I'll address your equally outrageous comments on Mr. Nye's educational goals. I must say that I found this to be one of the most disingenuous parts of what is, by anyone's standards, one of the most insincere and duplicitous pieces of videography that's been flushed onto YouTube service since Kenthoven was taken offline after discovering that not being entirely honest with the IRS is not the wisest rectal preservation strategy. You see, Ken, this is kind of rich coming from the man who's infamous for brainwashing little children with the following example of outrageous and nauseatingly repugnant shitbaggery. One of the problems we have today is that people tend to start outside the Bible, listen to what man is saying, and take those ideas to the Bible and say, how do we fit with this a Bible? How do we fit it with the Bible? But we shouldn't do it that way. We shouldn't start from man's ideas. We should start from the Bible, should put in our biblical glasses, and when we understand what the Bible says about the history of the universe, it gives us a whole way of thinking to explain uh, the things of this world. So for you to then criticize a nationally recognized educator for teaching children what to think rather than how to think, perhaps represents the scaling of the ultimate pinnacle of creationist hypocrisy, the zenith of the disregard for truth and decency to which you bastards can aspire. Not only did you take the cake on this one, but you scarfed it down like a gluttonous pig at a trough and then shat it out in the expectation that everyone would accept it as Shinola. Well, unfortunately for you, Ken, I don't, and I'm here to point out where that repulsive stench is coming from. If evolution were true, I mean, it'd be so obvious to the kids that it's true, but it's not. The way to convince kids about evolution is you have to do what Bill Nye the Humanist Guy wants. You protect them from hearing anything about creation, you totally indoctrinate them, you brainwash them, you don't teach them to think critically at all, don't teach them the difference between historical science and observational science, you just want to make sure they only hear about evolution and that's it. Once again, ignoring your almost morbid fascination with historical science, allow me to point out another sign of your tenuous if not non-existent grasp of reality. That is your inability to recognize the utter banality of your assertion that evolution can't be true because it's not intuitively obvious to children. Perhaps you haven't noticed, Ken, but quantum mechanics isn't intuitive to trained physicists, let alone kids. 
and yet we've used it to build the computer systems that you use to spread the contents of your sickly stunted mind all over the world. I could of course mention countless other concepts, but I think I've made my point. If I didn't know any better, I'd have to conclude that this apparent attempt at an argument was a joke, but since I do know better, I realize that the only joke involved is you. As for your subsequent brazenly projected polemic about indoctrination, well at this point I'm going to share with you what my friend Wisdom in Nature 7, a professional philosopher and educator that anybody who values truth and honest free thought should in my opinion be subscribed to, had to say about it in a recent PM exchange with me, because he enunciated it far far more eloquently than I ever could. You may also want to mention that humanist pedagogy is rooted in the rejection during the Renaissance and Enlightenment of rote religious instruction. Indeed, a humanist education can be characterized both by its aversion to preaching and by its appetite for discursive rather than didactic methods. The upshot is that critical thinking in modern education of the sort that Ham pays lip service to should by rights be credited to the humanists. Put another way, free thought and secular humanism share a very recent intellectual ancestor. And what Ham accuses Nye of doing is almost precisely what humanist educators strive to avoid. Evidently, our Ken wouldn't know the difference between a humanist education and a pterodactyl's anus. Creationists, of course, are very happy to teach their children about evolution and teach the problems with it and teach their children how to think critically and the difference between historical science and observational science. Isn't it interesting how Christians are not frightened to teach their children about evolution? I have to say, Ken, that your obsession with this historical boondoggle of yours is verging on the psychotic because you seem to be as enamored of it as Kirk Cameron is of Ray Comfort's banana. If you think that anybody outside your insular, blinkered and spectacularly backward mindset believes that the education you're referring to amounts to any more than Evolution says we all came from rocks, that's dumb! Then you're sorely mistaken. Because your own use of the phrase came from slime right here and countless other absurdities elsewhere, your ubiquitous exhortation to the use of biblical glasses, your smug insistence on the validity of the profoundly inane question were you there, or scream to the fact that what you claim you teach as evolution is in fact nothing but the hideously malformed parody of it that you've conjured up with your retarded imagination. And while you and your misguided sheep might think you're doing them a favor, Ken, the sad fact is that all you're doing is hiding from them the true magnificence of creation. The vastness of the cosmic deep and the majestic sweep of countless eons during which all that we see and hear and touch evolved from nothing but pure and unadulterated energy. The exquisitely simple behaviors of unimaginably infinitesimal particles that combine in countless combinations and from which emerge the most astonishingly complex phenomena from the intricacy of a single snowflake to the wonders of the human brain. A brain that has coalesced over countless eons to a point where it has unraveled the secrets of nature and can now look back in awe at the long and twisted path it took to get here and know that it is a part of the universe as much as the universe is a part of it. This is what you're denying your children, Ken, and I feel like weeping for them. Unlike you, I don't claim to know for certain whether a god does or does not exist, but if one does, the fact remains that modern science has shown us that its creative power and foresight are infinitely more extraordinary than those of the fictitious petty conjurer whose robes you insist on clinging to. And if one does exist, all you're doing is shielding your poor children's minds from its true grandeur, and while you continue to do so, I very much doubt that it's going to be particularly impressed with you.